Welcome to Fresh Outlook. I'm Frank Cipolla. We hope you had a pleasant week. We start our show with a look at what's happening on Wall Street. The Dow Jones Industrials surged more than 2% Friday, but not before one of the worst January in years. Crude oil prices continue to tumble. China's slowing economy is a concern. And this past week, we learned our economy is slowing a bit as well. With their unique perspective, we welcome former Wall Street trader and co-founder of Total Merchant Resources in Piscataway, New Jersey, Val Pinkasov. Also joining us is Brian Dolan, who is with Drive Wealth, and Jim McCarthy from Directional Wealth Management. Also in our DC studios, we have Jim Pierce. He is from Investing Daily and Baton Investing. Gentlemen, welcome. Thanks, Frank. Thanks. Let us, uh, let us discuss what's going on. First of all, uh, why is January such a lousy month after we had fairly good 2015? We'll start with you. You know, historically, whenever rates are raising, right, the market has a little bit of a uh, pause. Mm -hmm. And then it starts to, you know, rally if they're happy, and then starts to come down. So I've read many times when, in history, the rates, you know, greatly affect, obviously, equities. But right, right now, also, the consumer is really upset that I think they're very disappointed in how our government is running our economy, how they're running the whole country, and now the rest of the world is struggling. You have China slowing down, you have the, the Middle East and all the other countries that export a lot of oil, they're hurting. And when you're, bringing, when you, when you're taking oil out of the ground right. at a higher cost than what you could sell it for, there's big trouble. And, and Jim, you're on the front lines with your uh, clients sure. who invest in, in the markets and overseas as well. Uh, I guess they were, uh, shall we say, frantic? <laughs> Well, I think, yeah, I mean, the market hates uncertainty, mm -hmm. and there's two huge uncertainties right now. One is the declining price of oil uh, and the concern over that. And the second thing is China, um, whether it's China, the chi slowing down of the Chinese economy or let's call it some mismanagement on the government's part of their equity markets. Mm -hmm. um, January 4th, the first Monday of this year, from a trading perspective, um, the Chinese market shut down. They hit some circuit breakers right. uh, at 7%, which was way too low a percentage for a circuit breaker. But that, you know, everybody came in Monday morning, first day of the new year, looking all excited. And uh, next thing you know, the Chinese market shut down. And that just sort of started us off on the wrong and foot. And we right? certainly felt it. Brian, yeah. how much does politics play in this? We have a presidential election this year. Mm. We have more candidates than we know what to do with. How does that play a part? Um, I'm looking at primarily as a distraction. Um, mm -hmm. And certainly when you look at some of these primaries going on right now, they're quite distracting. Uh, but um, I, the politics, I think the big takeaway for your viewers is that um, they should not expect any sort of major fiscal stimulus coming out of the United States government anytime soon. So um, that's, that's the only takeaway I've got in terms of the politics. But going back to what our uh, other guests were talking about, um, I, I'm looking at the whole picture as a, a lot of missteps by the Chinese, right. poor communications, and what they triggered was basically a market uh, deluge uh, and panicked investors globally. Um, and so you saw this across all different risk assets, oil leading the way, commodities in general going down, mm -hmm. Chinese stocks collapsing, they messed up with their circuit breaker uh, 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 remedy, um, and, but they have since stepped up and corrected it. We're starting to see other movement from other central banks right. attempting to uh, address these problems. So I'm looking at January as and a great opportunity. And it's a worldwide problem, not just us. Mr. Correct. Pierce, you're right about this. You're with Bataan Investing. Uh, did anybody see this coming? Could they see this coming? I don't think they saw the severity of it coming. Now, I will say that Investing Daily, uh, a couple of months ago, we went almost entirely into large cap value stocks. Uh, we were concerned about uh, momentum stocks really slowing down. I wasn't expecting the entire market to take the beating that it has, but we were expecting a segment of it to really slow down in anticipation of the Fed raising rates. Now, Val, I talked with you earlier about being on the front lines, Jim actually being on the front lines, but you know, you traded for a while, so yeah. what, what does the average trader think now who's doing it on their own and doesn't have the uh, uh, Jim working with them? You know, traders don't look at fundamentals. They look at they don't. Know, technical, technical analysis is what's very important to them. You know? And I've learned when I was trading for all those years, mm -hmm. You know, fundamentals almost never ruled what was going on in that moment in that stock. So they're not looking at the data across the country and the world, they're just they're definitely looking at the data, right? But they're applying a lot of technical analysis. Mm -hmm. If the market, explain, if the market really trained, uh, tr uh, traded based on fundamentals, right. you know, a lot of other things would be would be happening historically. 
but when when stocks are being looked at strictly as you know a profit center you right. know how do i make money right now right. trading facebook or how do i make money trading you know twitter you know all those big brands back when i was trading you know the dot coms were ruling right. you know technology was huge and fundamentals unfortunately created the tone for that day but technical trading is what's so much more important and unfortunately you know you have price manipulation because of that you know if things really traded based on what was going on in the world so it would be different price manipulation inside or information that they're using i wouldn't call it just a gut feeling Look, insider information is criminal, right? right. But we're not things, insinuating that. Right, though, so. things happen, you yeah. know. And when things happen, you're expecting a result, and that result is not what's going on. You're thinking, well, why didn't that happen? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I hate to bring up a movie, but The Big Short that just came out a few weeks ago, yes. right? The gentleman who, who foresaw what was happening <clears throat> in, in the whole real estate bubble, mm -hmm. right? They hedged their bets, and they were on the right side. Right. And it took weeks or months, I, I forget what the timeline was, for the rest of for, them. For all those companies who hedged against them and thought right. that they were fools mm -hmm. to actually fess up and mark all those positions to market. All right, well, let me throw this at you. We're told by people like Jim all the time that, you know, it's, you're in there for the long run. Mm -hmm. you, you invest your money, there's going to be ups and downs, there's going to be corrections. It just, it's the way the market works. True. But, you know, how do you convince one of your clients who was frantic this past month that maybe this is not a correction that the GDP last quarter went down in the United States, mm -hmm. that oil is, is at almost at rock bottom prices and could go lower, that this might not be a correction, this might be actually a trend, a slump down. Sure. Well, I mean, it, it always could be, Frank, and, and basically we always have with our clients what we consider, a, we call it an uncle point. So a what point? An uncle, you know, like the old game where, you know, okay. when do you say <laughs> uncle, okay. you know? Um, so, you know, when, at what point it, for each client, and it's different for everybody, everybody's tolerance for risk is a little bit different. Right. Uh, but at what point would, would we say, okay, we need to take some significant action here? Um, and we're taking subtle actions all along. I mean, we're not just ignoring what's going on. Have you taken significant action with some of your clients in, this in, month? In reality, no, I haven't, because um, a couple of things uh, have happened. I mean, GDP has slowed down in the U.S., but it is still positive, um, and I still anticipate somewhere in the 2 to 2%, 2.5% 2 range of GDP growth in the U.S. Um, just on Friday, there were some very positive economic reports. Consumer sentiment, which is 70% of the economy, was right. still pretty good. The Chicago Purchasing Manager Index, not to get technical, but it came in better than expected. Mm -hmm. Corporate earnings so far in the fourth quarter are, are, are holding up reasonably well. That was a big concern. Um, yeah, but it's perspective out there. It's what people believe is happening. Right, right? And that's you can what, show them the numbers, but right. it's what they believe. Well, a lot of it is what, you know, people that work with somebody like myself or Brian work with us because they want that perspective. Mm -hmm. They want to get away from all the noise that's provided mm -hmm. by the right. media, and they want to get underneath that and understand what's all really right, going so Brian, on. All right, so Brian, what do you tell your clients when the, you know January has up and they've had a lousy January? What do you see for February? First, I caution them throughout January that to a Focus on the big picture. Ignore all that noise that's taking place. These markets are panicking. A lot of it was liquidity, short-term traders uh, getting out, bailing out. Uh, but staying focused on the fundamentals, the long-term picture, U.S. is still quite solid. Uh, Europe, Japan, not as strong, but still plus one-ish percent, one and a half or so. China, still growing at six and a half or so percent. Um, so the big picture hasn't really changed. So what this uh, represents, I think, is a value opportunity. We, markets have just given us anywhere from a 10 to 20 percent discount in most asset when prices. When you say a value opportunity, yeah. layman's terms is you should put some more money into the market. Buy, right buy into this bargain basement. Don't you like to buy I, things I at a discount? Why do you disagree? Because they were saying the same thing back in 2007. You know, and nobody believed it. The government didn't believe it. Wall Street yeah. didn't believe it. Very and half the Wall Street but, firms but, are gone. It was a very different environment. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, this is this. A lot of what's going on here is based on oil, and oil's a huge factor. Yes. It's impacting. It's it's impacting the manufacturing industry in the U.S. and certainly in China. Absolutely. But that's a much smaller segment of our economy than the housing market, which affects everybody. Well, this fracking as well. Let's go to Mr. Pierce in Washington D.C. Um, you're, you're pretty plugged in there. What are your experts telling you about what's happening on Wall Street? Well, you know, Wall Street, to a certain degree, is uh, maybe sort of decoupling from, from parts of the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. If you just looked at the U.S. stock market and U.S. economy, you wouldn't think there was any particular reason to be overly concerned about a 20% decline in the market. But uh, I think people are becoming increasingly concerned that the wave of currency devaluation and Japan's recent uh, 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 
actually a, a negative, I guess, yes. their equivalent of the Fed funds rate. How far that's going to go and, and, and how far that wave is going to roll around the world? And can the United States continue to function almost completely independently of what's going on in, in the rest of the world? Well, uh, what about OPEC? They're meeting in, in a week or so, if memory serves. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and talking about pulling back production to get the, the oil prices up, is that is that a remedy or is that just a well, I smoke think, and mirrors at no, this point? I, well, whether they do it or not, I mean, I think one of the things that's given me some, and I've shared with my clients, feeling that the oil is somewhere near a bottom. I'm not trying to call a particular dollar amount per barrel, but you're seeing the, part of what was in, affecting the sell-off in, in January was sovereign wealth funds, these mm. OPEC countries, right. are having to actually liquidate assets, which mm. were mostly in U.S. equities, because they've been the best place to be for the last five or six mm. years, to, to cover budget deficits because they are producing at a loss. Okay, so now they're starting to feel the pain to the point where they're saying, you know what, maybe a month ago or back in the end of last year in their last OPEC meeting, they all stood strong and right. said, no, we're not going to cut production. And this is a whole political thing with the U.S. frackers. All right, but who, who on the panel thinks that oil is going to go lower? I believe it is going to go lower. I don't think we're at the bottom yet. I think it's going to go lower a little bit and then stay there for a little while, you mm -hmm. know, in order to continue to shake people out and, you know, kind of reinforce what's going on in the world. You what know? about, you know, the theory out there is the Saudis did this because they want to run the fracking industry out of business because they're flooding the market. Is that a, is that a legitimate uh, theory or conspiracy theory, however you want to look I'd at it? I'd label it a conspiracy theory. Certainly they are, the fact that they have maintained production in the light of the price decline suggests mm -hmm. that they are con concerned about their market share and they're certainly, and so the frackers are part of that. So if they happen to kick them out of the market, so be it. Uh, they're not going to be opposed to that. Um, the uh, uh, short uh, uh, increase in prices will put the frackers back into, into profit. So it's not that big a deal. I'm much more of the view that we have seen a low likely in oil. And I, that doesn't mean we're going to go up. I think we're going to stay sub $45 a barrel in West Texas. Um, but you know the dollar, the dollar is likely peaked out now with the Fed's uh, in rate increases now put on hold. I think indefinitely, okay. uh, and then other easing elsewhere. All right, we got a couple of minutes. Let's go around the horn. We'll thank Mr. Pierce for joining us, and we'll we'll start with you. What do you see happening this year as far as as the as the markets? Will we be up or down by December? Actually, by December, I think we'll be up net for the year. It's going to be a fairly wild ride. The first half of this year, in particular. Uh, I, don't, I don't see the stock market's problems completely behind it yet. There'll still be some more spasms. But uh, by the second half, by the end of December, I would expect, the, say, the S&P 500 to be up between like 5 and 8% for the year. Okay, we thank you very much. Brian, your uh, view? Um, I'm not looking for very much of a change at the, by the end of the year. I think we'll seesaw back and forth. And so for the buy and hold type investor, it's going to be a problematic year. For the more active investor, buying dips, taking profit on rebounds and rallies, I think is the way to go for this year. Net, uh, net gain at the end of a the year? A small net gain, if anything. Jim? Uh, I'm in the same camp. Small single-digit net gain on, gain on the S&P. I think interest rates pretty much stay where they are, right mm -hmm. around so 2 there's to 2.5%. No interest rate. There may be one more hike, but in reality, they hiked in December, and interest rates are now lower than they were in December. Mm -hmm. So that's got a lot of other right, things. Now we're going to give you the last word. What does 2015 shape up for uh, uh, on Wall Street? My opinion is that things are going to be... 2016. I said 2015, 2016. <laughs> I think things are going to be very volatile, and I think towards the end of the year, we're going to see you know, a little bit of what we saw in January, you know, a, a lot of uneasiness. Mm -hmm. And I think the global economy is a little bit in trouble right now. Right. And they need a lot of, um, you know, resolve to figure out what's going to be the best way to handle China and what's going to be the best way to handle Europe to, to figure out what to do next before and, people and start to feel like there's legs under the whole global economy. And of course, the election is always the wild card. Yeah, definitely. As well. Gentlemen, thank you for joining thank us. You. We appreciate sure. it. When we return, is being wealthy and coddled a defense for manslaughter. We'll be right back.